while they are doing that, I have a couple of greetings that have been sent to you. The first one, my daughter Rachel, talked to her on the phone yesterday. Many of you remember Rachel and Paul Ronk, missionaries in Haiti sometime. They know they've been here numbers of times. Anyway, she said, be sure and tell them hello for me. So, hello from Rachel to you. Then yesterday I saw Clay Bailey. Many of you older folk will remember Clay. Clay and Joanne have been moved to an assisted living place. I saw them yesterday and Clay said to me to tell you hello from him. So hello from Clay Bailey to you. I appreciate the opportunity of being back with you. I looked, I keep a record of all my sermons and where I preached and so forth. My first preaching here was in 1990. And I was thinking as I was observing this morning that some of those who were teenagers then now have teenagers. <laughs> and some of you who were my age then, well, you're still my age. <laughs> Time has moved on. God's kingdom is still alive and well. And we know this. Regardless what happens in this world otherwise, God is still on His throne and His church is going to prevail. The gates of Hades or hell cannot prevail against the church. We are so blessed to be a part of the family of God. Our theme this week is biblical questions that stir the soul. Our souls need to be stirred. Revival has to do with the stirring of the soul. Mm -hmm. We need to be exposed to the Word of God to stir our souls for God. Now the first question that we're going to be looking at is the first question God asked man. In the Bible. Does anybody want to tell us where that came from? When is the first time God asked a question of man? Well, you should have on your sheet there that question. It actually ties in with our communion meditation this morning. It has to do with Adam and Eve. I want you to read together the question at the top of the sheet that you have. One, two, three, read. Where, Where are you? Where are you? Now we're going to look at that question a little bit more as we go through. But I want you to see that that question God asked was not for His information. God knew where Adam and Eve were. God asked the question so they would know where they were and where they were in relationship to Him. God had made a great, big, wonderful world. God had made the sun that shines so brightly like this morning. God had made the moon in all of His beauty. God had made the stars of the sky in all of their splendor. God had made the oceans. He had made the mountains. He had made the valley like Shady Valley. I remember being here in October. I was here at the ideal time apparently at least once. 
and all around beautiful, beautiful trees. And I remember it to this day. God made all of that. And then God made Adam and Eve in His own image, in His own likeness. And when God had done that, God said, it's very good. Oh, the goodness of God. And then God placed Adam and Eve in the garden there of Eden. And He gave them everything, including the tree of life that we've heard about already. God gave them everything they needed. I mean, they had it made. They had life at its best and its fullest. And they had a perfect relationship with God. And they could walk with God and talk with God and fellowship with God. I mean, they had paradise. But then something changed. Satan enters the picture. And what I want us to look at this morning, and I want you to follow through with me on the handout I gave you, I want us to see man's downward journey. Man's downward journey. They fell. But the thing I want to note this morning especially is this. The story of their fall is a lot like the story of our fall. Their story is really our story. We see ourselves in them. Now let's look at their downward journey. It started when they doubted God. Verses 1 through 5 here in Genesis 3. <clears throat> Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God really said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. What does Satan do? Satan implants doubt concerning God's word. God had told them, you know, you need everything here in the garden, everything's provided for you, except you can't eat of that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, you eat of that, you're going to die. Satan starts planting the doubt. And Satan says, oh, you can eat of that. You won't really die. God wouldn't do that, would he? I mean, God made you. God loves you. God provided all of this for you. God surely didn't mean you'd really die. God surely didn't mean that it was really that bad of a thing. I mean, you don't really believe God would do that, do you? Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like God would say, you shall surely die, and then Satan come along and say, oh, not really, not really. You don't really believe God would do that. He loves you. He made you. And Satan will cause people to doubt the truthfulness of his word. But as Adam and Eve learned, and I hope you and I have learned by now, and that is this, God says what he means. Mm -hmm. And God means what he says. Heaven and earth will pass away, his word won't pass away. 
Folks, if you start doubting God, you start doubting God's Word, you are on a downward journey too. So don't doubt God. Believe Him. He does say what He means, and He means what He says, and you can go by it. Old timers would say you can take it to the bank. I'm not sure if we think of that security now as they did. But I'll tell you what, you can believe it. If God says it, that settles it. So believe God. Well, after Satan starts implanting that doubt, the next thing we see, and you'll see on your outline, is they desired the forbidden. Look at verse 6 now. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. The next thing Satan does after planning the doubt is he shows how desirable the forbidden is. It says here in verse 6, the woman saw it was good for food. Looked good to her. And it was a delight to the eye. Oh, a delight. And that it was going to make her wise. I mean, she could become wise like God. Who doesn't want to be that wise? And so it looked so desirable that it caused her downfall. Let me say this to you this morning. Satan dresses up sin to make it look desirable. To make it look attractive. To make it look like, well, that's something I want. And Satan paints a beautiful picture of that which God has said, don't touch. Don't eat. Sin. It's appealing. We are deceiving ourselves if we think sin is not appealing. If sin was not appealing, there'd be no temptation. It's because it looks good. It looks desirable. And that's why Satan paints the picture. But I want to tell you something. It doesn't end up being a beautiful thing at all. The cost is too great. If God forbids it, then listen to God for your soul's sake. David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba looked desirable to David. God had said you shall not commit adultery. But David did it. Because he saw her as desirable, just like Eve saw that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as something desirable. But he doesn't show you the guilt. He doesn't show you the emptiness. He doesn't show you what you've got to live with after you disobey God. And David's life turned into being quite, be quite Miserable because he had disobeyed God. For so God's way is best. Don't let Satan deceive you. It may look desirable. Like Achan. Do you remember Achan? Remember Achan? There at the battle of Jericho. God delivered Jericho, but God had said, Now you can't take any of the spoils. You got to leave everything there. But the Bible tells us Achan saw some gold. Why leave gold there in that rubble? Saw some silver. Why leave that silver? Achan was thinking, well, I could do a lot with that silver. And then some of those Babylonian garments, they look pretty good too. And Achan said, I saw, I coveted, and I took. 
God said don't take it. He did exactly what God said not to do. Just like David with Bathsheba. Just like Eve at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Folk, every time, every time we disobey God, we pay consequences. We, brethren, all have to pay. You want life at its best, life at its fullest, then realize that uh, Satan will make it look desirable. But it is going to destroy you. Well, let's go on in their downward journey. They doubted God. They desired the forbidden. And then they did it. They disobeyed God's word. Back to verse 6 again. She took of that fruit of the tree and ate and gave some to her husband with her and he ate. Isn't it interesting when you sin? You usually drag somebody else into it also. You don't sin alone most of the time. Not when you sin, somebody else is going to be affected. You commit adultery, somebody else is affected. You steal, somebody else is affected. You lie, somebody else is affected. They disobeyed God. Now God gives us the choice. God tells us what to do. God tells us what not to do. But he leaves it up to you and to me whether we obey or disobey. We are creatures of choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. But haven't you? Haven't we all? All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his or her own way. Everybody has disobeyed God. And we have to say, guilty. Been there and done that. It's true. We should be living by the theme. Whatever the Lord says, we'll do. We'll obey. Trust and obey. No other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and to obey. I hope you have committed yourself to obeying God in all things. If you haven't done it yet, I hope you'll do it now, this morning, today. That whatever the Lord says, that's what you're going to do. What the Lord says not to do, you're not going to do. You are going to obey Him in all things, at all times, in all ways. But we've not always lived up to that, have we? And like Adam and Eve, we've been on a downward journey sometimes and disobeyed God. Well, what's the next step here? This falling away from God, this downward journey, they tried to hide from God. Look now at verse 8. Now when they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Hiding from God. I don't know what made them think they could do it, but they tried. And they're not the last ones who tried to hide from God. Other people have done it. Of course, we probably think of Jonah as an example. Remember when Jonah disobeyed God? God told him to go to Nineveh. He went the opposite direction toward Tarshish. And he got on the ship. And he sailed away. And the storm came. Jonah was thrown overboard. And God had prepared a great big fish to swallow him. And then that fish vomited him out on the shore. You don't hide from God. God knew where Adam and Eve were. God knows where you are in your relationship with Him. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Don't treat sin lightly and don't think you can hide from God. You cannot. No one can. We are all like open books. He knows every what we think is secret. 
God knows. God knows what's on your heart this morning. And God knows your relationship or your lack of relationship to Him this morning. God knows whether you're right with Him. You may fool me. You may fool others. Wasn't it Abraham Lincoln that said something like this? You know, you can, you can fool many people most of the time. You, you, you can. You can fool some part of the time. But you can't fool God any time. You don't hide from Him. He knows it all. You're an open book to God. You can't hide from Him. What did the uh, psalmist say? He said, If I go to the highest heights, behold, you're there. If I go to the deepest depths, behold, you're there. If I go to the broadest breadth, behold, you are there. Where can I escape from the presence of God? What was the psalmist's conclusion? Same as yours and mine, I hope. <laughs> you can't hide from Him. You cannot go anywhere but what God's already there. Remember that. You can't go anywhere but what God is already there. Well, let's go on. After trying to hide from God, they're found out. Verses 8 through 11 now. After they heard the sound of the Lord God walking, Cool the day, the man and his wife hid themselves. We just had. Then verse 9, Then the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? That's our question to stir the soul. Where are you? He, the man, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? Well, we'll stop there for a moment. Where are you? God knows. Don't think that God doesn't know about you. Don't think that God doesn't know about what we have all done. Don't think that God is in the dark. God knows it all. There are no secrets from Him. Everything is open. There is nothing hidden from God like an open book to Him. If we really believe that, don't you think it would change some of our conduct? If we really knew that, that God knows exactly not only what we do, even what we are thinking. God knows and you're going to be found out. And so am I. Well, let's go on. Number six on your outline, they tried to escape responsibility. Look at verses 12 and 13 now. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You see what they're trying to do? Play the blame game. Adam, what did you do? Oh, it's that woman you gave me, God. It's that woman's fault. She ate first and then gave to me. So it's the woman's fault. I've known people blame their mates. We had a lady in West Virginia, I'll never forget. I don't reckon it's lost out of my mind at all. She was coming to church and her husband wasn't and he did not want her coming. So she finally quit. And I was talking to her about it. She said, well, if I go to church, he 
makes it like hell on earth for me. He makes it so rough for me. I just can't do it. Well, I remember to this day some of what I told her during that time. And some of what I told her at that time was, you know, I'm so sorry. And I know it must be tough. I have a man that would mistreat you if you come to church. But I would rather have some mistreatment from man for a little while than be in hell forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. Don't let your mate keep you from being faithful to Christ. Christ must be first in your life. I tell people all the time, your mate should not be first in your life. And some of you parents may want to throw a rotten tomato if you have one at me, but your children should not be first either. Your children should not be first in your life. Yeah. Jesus should be first. You obey Him. You live for Him. Now, if you'll do that, you'll be a better mate. You want to do something for your mate? Put Jesus first. And you'll be a better parent. You want to be a better parent? Put Jesus first. The best thing you can teach your children is to put Jesus as number one in their lives. That's more important than teaching them to dribble a basketball or hit a baseball. More important than soccer. It's more important than dancing. It's more important than anything else. And if you teach your children all these other things and you give them all those opportunities and you don't lead them to Jesus, then you have failed as a parent. Don't try to blame somebody else. And I hear it frequently. I've heard some people say, well, I don't go to church because of my parents. You know, they made me go when I was a child and I determined when I got to make my own decision, I wasn't going anymore because my parents forced it on me when I was little. And then I've heard others use the exactly opposite. I've heard people say, well, I don't go to church. My parents never taught me to go. They never went, so I don't either. Our responsibility to God is personal. It's inescapable. And Adam and Eve trying to blame one another as Eve tried to blame the devil. You've heard others say, the devil made me do it. That's a lie from the devil. You chose. Oh, the devil can influence you. And he will. But it is your choice. It's your responsibility. So don't blame mates. Don't blame parents. Don't blame anyone else. It is your responsibility to obey God. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. I need to be like the prodigal son and say, I, I have sinned. Well, let's go on. They're punished in verses 16 to 19. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall deliver children. Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. With hard labor you will eat from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. That bad consequences, wasn't it? They were punished. There was pain, sorrow, grief, heartaches, trials, troubles, and even thorns and thistles because of their sin. Now we 